Good morning, everyone. I want to wish you welcome in the second day of the conference, uh, Social Justice, New Horizon, New Perspective, uh, in the name of the Institute for Philosophy and Social Theory, in the name of a uh, group of social engagement studies, and in the name of other cooperators who with us organized this event. Uh, this session we will have two lectures from Snežana Pridz Samarzija, uh, Social and Epidemic Justice in Justice, ep Epistemic, uh, sorry, and from Christian Pieler, uh, Broom and Aristotle on Fairness. Snežana Pridz Samarzija is full professor at University of Rijeka and one of directors of Center for Advanced Studies, South Eastern Euro Europe in Rijeka. She studied philosophy at University Belgrade and finished magistery at University of Ljubljana. Uh, she made her PhD uh, in social epistemology at the University of Zagreb. Since 1997, she works at University of Rijeka and now she is full professor at the Department of Philosophy, Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences and vice rector at this university. During the time, she was the editor-in-chief of Croatian Journal of Philosophy, the director of Rijeka University Foundation, and director of several courses and conferences at the International University Center Dubrovnik. Also, she was visiting professor at many European universities, such as Oxford University, University of Budapest, Padova, and so on. Her main area of interest are social epistemology, feminist epistemology, uh, social and ontology recently, uh, questions about institutions. The title of her today's lecture so is Social and Epidemic Justice or Injustice. Thank you. Ivan, Igor, sorry <laughs> for this introduction. Hello to everyone. So I'm really happy I'm here with you at this conference and I would like to thank to all the organizers, uh, especially my dear colleagues from the Institute. So as Igor said, the title of my, my presentation is Social and Epistemic Justice or Injustice. Here is the plan of my paper. In the first part, I would like very briefly to say something about social epistemology, actually to explain my perspective, you know, between traditionalism and reductionism in social epistemology. In the second part, I would like to explain what is actually epistemic justice or epistemic injustice, that it is actually epistemically wrong and socially unjust discrimination in ascribing rational authority. In the third part, I would like to explicate the problem concerning the definition of epistemic justice or injustice, actually the, the, the conflict between epistemic and political or ethical or social, social values. Or I would like to ask the question, can social justice abolish epistemically culpable judgments or vice versa? And finally, if I would have enough time, I would like to, to, to propose several models, several solutions, and I would like to prefer something I called actually hybrid model. So first, social epistemology. What is social epistemology? Social epistemology is subdiscipline of epistemology with deals, which deals with the process of belief formation, retention, and revision of an individual epistemic agent conduced in social interaction with other cognizers. Social epistemology also deals with the epistemic property of groups, uh, uh, communities, institutions, social systems, but it's not at this very moment the, the topic of my concern. So, social epistemology is actually investigation and critical evaluation of socially situated epistemic processes, and I rely here on the Goldman's actually definitions. Social epistemology is actually a kind of applied epistemology, as we have you know, the ethics and applied ethics, so we have applied epistemology because you know, uh, it's something like real world epistemology. This is the epistemology which deals with the real social, social relation, epistemic relations. So we have traditional approach in social epistemology and reductivism or reductionist approach in social epistemology. Traditional approaches 
actually uh, contained in the standard analytical philosoph philosophy actually makes, makes no reference to practical cognitive issues uh, within the real social world. Uh, actually, it is fo focuses on the acquisition of knowledge in idealized circumstances. Individual epistemic agents are perce perceived as persons of unlimited logical competences and a social being who is isolated from any socio-political context. So traditional epistemology actually do not deal, does not deal with the social relations. Truth and rationality were detached from social power and social identities of epistemic agents. This is a traditional approach. On the other side, we have reductionist approach, actually ascribed or associated with the movements such as postmodernism, social constructivism, sociology of knowledge, or cultural studies uh, that stress uh, social aspects of knowing. It's Barnes, Bloor, Foucault, Rorty, and many, many other people. Actually, they announced the death of epistemology, meaning actually traditional epistemology. Traditional epistemic concepts of truth, rationality, justification, problem solving, or like, were rejected. Epistemic investigations are reduced exclusively to the uh, deconstruction of beliefs on the social relations of power. My point, my social epistemology, I, I uh, said it is a real social epistemology, it's actually not my qualification, but the qualification of Alvin Goldman or uh, uh, Miranda Freaker. Social, uh, truly social epistemology is actually somewhere in between traditionalism and reduct reductivism or reductionism. It's somewhere between uh, these extremes. What does it mean? Uh, real social epistemology assumes a social situatedness of knowledge while maintaining the central epistemic values of traditional epistemology such as truth, uh, uh, rationality, justification, problem solving, or like. So, epistemic agents form, retain, and revise <coughs> belief, judgments, decisions under social influences. This is the first thesis. And the second thesis is that these beliefs, judgments, or decisions are not mere social constructions of social power, but need to be evaluated as more or less truth conductive, rational, justified, epistemically more successful in problem solving, or like. So this is my, my starting point, my perspective. From this perspective, I would like to, to explain the notion of epistemic injustice. I would start with testimony and credibility judgments. Uh, just briefly to explain this. Other people, their reports or testimonies are sources uh, on the basis of which we actually form, retain, or revise our beliefs. The assessment of other people's reports, the assessment of informants are more or less credible as more, more or less credible is the basic epistemic practice you know so the paradigmatic epistemic situation in society is actually sorry credibility judgment yeah? or assessments of an informant's trustworthiness or the reliability of their reports so i will start with this my second idea second point is that these credibility judgments actually depend on social identity of informants or, more precisely, on stereotypes and prejudices related or between uh, other uh, 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 things, on stereotypes and prejudices related to particular social identity. And I rely here on the Miranda Spreaker's book on, uh, on epistemic injustice. So stereotypes and prejudices about certain social identities contain and a collective social imaginarium depend on the informant's social status, the social power, actually, or powerlessness of the informant's social group. So, if we have this, we have, and the second or the third step, such some kind of prejudicial dysfunction in credibility judgments or in testimonial practices. Actually, a cognizer perceives the speaker as a member of social group defined by education, gender, age, race, class, regional, regional background, many, many other 
social identities. So this, there, there are, or I, distinguished between two main cases of prejudicial dysfunctions. Credibility excess, where the speaker receives more credibility than she deserves due uh, uh, his social state, social identity, and credibility deficit, where the speaker receives less credibility than actually she deserves due their uh, 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 social status. So the examples. Credibility excess, there is a marvelous example of Shapi. Actually, uh, 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 he wrote about the social status of the gentlemen in the 17th century England. And this social status actually ensured to English gentlemen not only a social privileges, but also a status of rational or epistemic authority. Rational and epistemic authority in all, actually, domains while non-gentlemen or women of any class were excluded from actually trustful con conversation or communication. There are other, many other, of course, cases of credibility excess where a hearer regularly ascribes more reliability to a member of a ruling elite or a privileged social group due to his social identity because of his race, gender, ethnicity, or like being a scientist, scientist of some domain, phys physicians, or like. On the other side, we have the credibility deficits. Cases of the credibility deficits, I mentioned here the freakers cases. You know, a man who describes to his female friend less reliability than she deserves due to her gender identity. And actually, she quotes uh, a sentence from uh, Patricia Heisman, talented uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Ripley. Marge, there is female in in intuitions, and there are facts. Also, Freakers mentioned Harper's Lee uh, 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 situation uh, and uh, to kill a, a, a mockingbird. A jury that thinks that the black man doesn't deserve a credibility due to his racial identity. She also mentioned the very concrete uh, 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 cases, a case of stop and search by the police where racial prejudice affects the perception of police officer so that the young black male driver receives a prejudically deflated level of credibility when he declares that he is the owner of the car. He was actually one very, very specific incident uh, published in, in, in the paper, uh, newspapers. I would like here to, to make a clear distinction at this very moment between epistemic discrimination and epistemic selection. Namely, an individual's social identity or status is not always irrelevant evidence for making credibility judgment. Yeah. Leftist can be more credible sources on union policies and procedures. A rich people about the lives of a golden youth. Biologists about cellular dysfunctions, etc. English gentlemen in the 7th century, century might have been more reliable informants about many issues also because of better actually access to education and a certain gentlemanly codex that socially sanctioned lies or competencies. So the socially unjust discrimination is not the epistemically justified selections of good informants. What is epistemic injustice? Epistemic injustice is a situation in which someone is epistemically discriminated on the basis of prejudices about the epistemic authority of members of a certain social group, which result in epistemically culpable cases of credibility excess or deficit. So epistemic injustice refers to a situation in which epistemically wrong credibility judgments is generated by socially unjust treatment of certain social groups. So we have, you know, two wrongness, let us say, uh, epistemic culpability and the social, political, ethical culpability at the same time. What is the consequences of credibility excess and credibility deficit? I would like to say that, that the, the, the consequences of credibility deficit is, is much, are much more serious than that of credibility excess. While credibility excess can malform someone's epistemic character, causing epistemic arrogance, rendering him closed-minded, dogmatic, blithely impervious to criticism, the consequences of credibility deficit are much more serious. 
credibility deficit excludes the subject from a trustful conversation. Not only it undermines the capacity for knowledge, which is essential to his value of a human being, but it thus discriminates him as a social being. So if we have the systematic credibility deficit, then uh, it can, they can cause different further injuries or injustice, economic, educational, professional, etc. So the final remark concerning the explanation of the notion of the epistemic injustice, epistemic injustice is hybrid assault, intellectual and ethical and political. Epistemic, inj uh, epistemic justice is generally hybrid actually value, in that it aims at both truth and justice and contains the very same motivation to eliminate or neutralize the social injustice in the basis of prejudice. So the problem, the conflict between social justice and epistemic justification. While cases of epistemic injustice are clear cases of epistemic and social culpability, there are situations in which social injustice can be connected with epistemic benefits or in which social just acts entail epistemic uh, culpability. Case first, I actually applied here on the words and the works on, let's say, very famous Croatian philosopher Sesardic, I don't know whether you know, you know him, he, he was at the King's College, now I mean, he, is, he is in Hong Kong. Uh, uh, the situation in which social injustice produces epistemic, situation in which social injustice produces epistemic benefits. So Sesardic said that political correctness, pro, pro, political correctness programs can generate epistemically suboptimal results. For instance, he said that epistemic discrimination or credibility deficit of members of certain racial and ethnic groups is justified by alleged evidence provided by statistic about the frequency of cases in which they are the initiator of criminal and terrorist assaults. So actually he justifies a kind of racial and ethnical discrimination because the, of epistemic ends. Second two is the situation in which social justice produces epistemic culpability. For instance, affirmative action programs of quotas for Afro-Americans at American universities or for women in parliaments, actually are criticized as epistemically unjustified because they can discriminate epistemically more deserving people who lose their positions and therefore impose them ethical, political, and economical, educational, actually, injustice. And the third case is the case in which we have epistemic benefits and epistemic benefits produce social injustice. So this is the cases of expertism, epistocracy, or epistemic paternalism. Expertism and episto epistocracy can be seen as a form of socially unjust, privileged treatment of experts in the decision-making process, or as a kind of elitist discrimination. Since experts are comparatively with, uh, to the other people, the best guides to truth, or at least to escaping false beliefs. Trusting experts usually results in justified beliefs. So we have the epistemic benefits there. However, epistocracy or expertism or epistemic paternalism of experts are usually seen as non-egalitarian, socially unjust, or anti-democratic. And the crucial people here are criticism of epistocracy from this point of view is Estland, Peter, famous Peter Estland, or Fabian Peter or uh, Kitcher, Philip Kitcher. Conclusion, we have here a clear conflict of values. Social injustice and epistemic mistakes are not necessarily connected, are not necessarily related, as well as social justice and epistemic success. Social injustice can generate epistemic success, for instance, in situation of expertism and ex epistemic paternalism, Social justice, on the other side, can generate epistemic culpability, as in situation of affirmative action. Uh, highlighting the impact of such conflict, some authors, like Sesardic, defend serious social injustice as the practice of avoiding, avoiding epistemic risk. And actually, they justify, they uh, uh, think that racial and ethnic discrimination is acceptable. 
So the diagnosis of problem. The, my question is, what is the criteria of proper evaluation of social injustice? You know, should we justify epistemic mistakes if they lead to social justice? Or should we justify epistemic benefits if they generate or assume social injustice? And here is my final part. I don't know whether I have enough time. Yeah, OK. So actually, as I can see, there are three models of possible solutions. And I prefer hybrid, hybrid model. The first solution is a veritistic model. Veritism stresses the epistemic outcomes. And the most prominent, let us say, representative of veritism is Alvin, very famous American epistemologist, Alvin Goldman, social epistemologist. Veritism uh, actually stresses the epistemic outcomes. The necessary condition for approval is epistemic success. So it is not acceptable to sacrifice epistemic goals in order to achieve social justice. On the other side, sacrificing social justice on some uh, cases, some elements of social justice for the sake of epistemic success can be justified in a certain cases. For instance, he, uh, uh, he thinks that epistemic paternalism or some, some uh, forms of uh, exp uh, expertism can be, can be justified. I think that racial discrimination of Sassardich type cannot be justified by appealing uh, also in this veritistic model uh, because actually it generates cre uh, credibility judgments. They will be more often wrong than correct, but I can explain then if it's, it would be necessary later. So this is this veritistic model. So we, we have the clear cases. If we have the social injustice and epistemic culpability, this is epistemic injustice. If we, ha we have social justice and epistemic success, we have the virtue of epistemic justice. But if we have social justice and epistemic culpability, according to Veritas model, it is unjustified. But if we have social injustice and epistemic success, in some cases, it can be justified. The second model is egalitarian model. Egalitarianism is focused on the social justice. As social justice is necessary for approval, it is acceptable to sacrifice epistemic success in order to ensure social justice. For instance, affirmative action programs. A situation in which social injustice is conductive uh, to epistemic success uh, is completely unacceptable. For instance, racial as well as elitist discrimination, expertism, or epistemic paternalism uh, are not actually acceptable. This is the Eslund's and the Peters position. And also the table, you can see there is no difference between egalitarian and veritas model in, in defining the uh, epistemic injustice and epistemic justice cases. But in this, when we, we, we are coped with the conflict of values, there are differences. So socially, social justice and epistemic culpability can be justified, but not social injustice and epistemic success cases. And finally, hybrid model. While veritism and egalitarianism make, make clear value priorities for all situations, so the truth on the one side or truth conductiveness on the one side or the justice on the other side, hybrid model insists on concrete assessment of outcomes in real situations and even pleads for a certain trade-off procedures. The hybrid model stresses the harmonization of intellectual and, and ethical political values in a concrete real work, world context. Okay, the table, uh, the table here. So in these problematic cases, hybrid model actually asks, requires some kind of contextual harmonization. What does it mean, harmonization? Yeah. For instance, in the case of affirmative action, we need, let us say, a more comprehensive analysis of long-term epistemic outcomes. So we can say, allowing for actions which may result, allowing for actions which may result in an imminent epistemically suboptimal outcome can be justified if there is a reasonable probability that there will produce better long-term epistemic results. So in the short term period, we have, let us say, suboptimal epistemic results. But in the long term, we have the better or the more searcher for the truth. Uh, the second case is uh, uh, expertism or kind of 
epistocracy. In the case of expertism, we could introduce a division of epistemic labor. It's actually Christianus' idea, Thomas Christianus' idea. The decisions about social priorities need to be left to the citizens, but decisions related to the measures of reducing budget deficits need to be left to the experts. So, in the concrete cases, we actually decided, you know, whether we can ex uh, accept uh, this kind of expertism and in cases in which we cannot. So, of course, the minimal desiderata of epistemic and ethical political correctness need to be uh, clearly defined. So, racial or ethnic discrimination cannot be justified in any trade-off scenario. There is no epistemic benefit that can justify by such a blatant case of serious social injustice. So I have put, you know, there's the minimal conditions, but I can skip uh, this. Uh, I would like only to say this, because uh, I know that I'm probably short with, with, with my time or not. OK, thank you. Uh, of course, I, I'm aware that, it can, that there, there, there are cases of persistent conflicts of aims. But in these cases, what we can do, actually, we can put here some kind of procedural requirements. Through consideration of variety perspectives, participants need to seek the best possible balance between ethically, politically permissible and factually well-grounded stances. And I actually applied here to the phronesis, Aristotelian phronesis, mediating value of phronesis or practical wisdom. wisdom. And I quote here, actually, Zagzebski's word. A wise person is able to weigh the demands of relevant virtues in a given situation, all things considered. So we cannot give the final recipe, the formula, what is justified and what is not justified. We can appeal on this virtue of phronesis in the cases in which we try to harmonizing the epistemic and uh, uh, ethical values. But we cannot, my point is that we should not, you know, to isolate ethical values from, from the epistemic values. You know, so I would like to say this here. What is the advantages of the hybrid model? Veritistic and egalitarian approaches are relevant. Of course, you know, the approaches who searches on, on the value of truth or, or the value of justice. But more concrete, real world hybrid approaches are much, much more appropriate for final assessments in the real world. A hybrid model ensures a better framework for making assessments in objectively difficult situation of conflict between values in which our intuitions are ambiguous. Uh, before, let us say, in veritistic uh, scenario or, or, or uh, 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 egalitarian scenario, we said, okay, we are thinking about justice. No, we are thinking about the truth. And we isolated the situations, you know. So from the epistemic perspectives, this is, you know, justified from the egalitarian or from the political perspectives, it is not justified. But it's not the case. In, in a real world, we have concrete cases and we need to keep, you know, to harmonize the both actually virtues. And actually my final slide, the hybrid model is better suited to the perspective of real social epistemology because veritism relies on traditionalism on traditional epistemology. Egalitarianism relies on reductionism, you know, on, let us say, postmodern orthodoxies, while, while veritism relies on analytical, standard analytical orthodoxies. Within the hybrid model, normativity is disconnected from idea about a social value of truth and connected with the idea of truth belief formation process that truth belief formation process can be unjust. So in hybrid model, the plausible idea that some people know more about certain issues is connected with sustained respect for egalitarian values. So thank you very much.